goodness. Now, folks, uh, of all the people to be fired by Donald Trump, my guest tonight is definitely one of them. <laughs> His new book is A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership. Please welcome former FBI Director James Comey. <laughs> Sir, uh, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started, um, you've done a lot of interviews. I do a lot of interviews. I just want you to know, um, I need loyalty. <laughs> I expect loyalty. Can you give me that? Eat your shrimp scampi. Was that over dinner? Yes, it was over dinner. All right. Well, all I ask for you is honesty tonight. Um, I know that when you were fired, you say in the book that uh, when, when it was over, you uh, flew back on a plane to the East Coast <laughs> drinking Pinot Noir out of a paper cup. So I thought maybe we could recreate that happy moment for you right now. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, <laughs> to the truth. Yes, to the truth. <laughs> That's quite now. Nice. Okay, so I've, I've seen your interview with George Stephanopoulos on Sunday night. Um, you did, how many hours did you talk to him? Over five. Five hours. And it was a one hour special and 22 minutes of it was the two of you talking. Right. All right, I'm gonna try to beat that tonight. All right? <laughs> and so uh, to keep the pace up, I don't usually look at my cards, but I'm, forgive me if I look at my cards tonight because there's so much to go over. I don't know if you know this, but you've got a fascinating story to tell. <laughs> First of all, you're, you're, you tell it in, in your new book, A, a Higher Loyalty. Um, I've read the book, something I don't generally do. And <laughs> it's, I, I, even without knowing you, I want you to know, I like the author of this. He's telling uh, fascinating stories about a, a, a life in uh, the Justice Department and in criminal justice. And he's telling stories about what it means to be an ethical leader. Um, why did you write this book? Because after I got fired, uh, it occurred to both me and my wife, Patrice, that a way I could be useful, she's always trying to find ways for good to follow bad, I could be useful by offering people a vision of what ethical leadership looks like and show people through a series of stories how ethical leaders make hard decisions. And it would be particularly useful now when our president is not that. And so she and I talked about it and decided, yeah, I'll do that. That's a way to be useful. When you, when you read the book, you talk about uh, prosecuting John Gotti, making the decision whether to go ahead with the prosecution of Martha Stewart, uh, Scooter Libby, um, uh, uh, talking about uh, confronting uh, the Bush administration about Abu Ghraib and about the, uh, domestic surveillance. Um, you can see you're a prosecutor. You're not just telling a story. You're laying out a case uh, f uh, for your actions regarding Hillary Clinton and her investigation and your um, run-ins with Donald Trump. It's, it's, a, it's an indictment of Donald Trump in describing what an ethical leader is. Um, do you think that he has, I know you don't like the man, but do you think he has an opportunity still to be an ethical leader? Can he turn his presidency around in your eyes? I think it'd be very hard given the way he is as a person. He's somebody who doesn't appear to have external reference points in his life. Ethical leaders, make the hardest decisions by looking to some reference point. For some, it's a religious tradition or history or logic or philosophy, tradition. And as far as I can tell, his reference point is entirely internal. What will, what will fill the hole in me and get me the affirmation that I need? And so I think it'd be very difficult. Now, he could be a more ethical leader. He could surround himself maybe with people who would serve as those external reference points, but I wouldn't be optimistic, honestly. You, you describe him as being, uh, or the people around him, as having a mob or a, a cosa nostra quality. What, what, what is it about him and the people around him that feels like the mob which you prosecuted to you? Yeah. The leadership style is actually strikingly similar. And when this first popped in my head, I pushed it away because I thought that's way too dramatic. How could that comparison be apt? And I don't mean it in the sense that Donald Trump is out breaking legs or shaking down shopkeepers. I mean it in the sense that he leads, it's all about the boss. What will serve the boss best? How are you helping the boss? 
It's all about that person and nothing external to that. And that reminds me very much of Cosa Nostra leadership. Well, if, if, if it felt like you were working for a, a mob boss, were you surprised that you got whacked? Because <laughs> that's what they do. I actually was quite surprised because I thought, I'm leading the Russia investigation. Even though our relationship was becoming strained, there's no way I'm going to get fired or, or whacked. Because, why? Why wouldn't you get fired? Because that would be a crazy thing to do. Why would you fire the FBI director who's leading the Russia investigation? <laughs> because you're leading the Russia investigation. <laughs> what, it says, I don't know if you've dealt with mob bosses before, but they don't <laughs> like to be investigated. Yeah. Um, are there things, uh, you know, I know you can't keep secrets and all that kind of stuff, but are there things that you know about the Russia investigation that were happening before you were fired that we haven't learned yet as a public? Yes. Can you tell me what those are? <laughs> uh, no. No? Yeah. Okay. And they're not in the book. The, I had to have my book reviewed by the FBI. Oh, to, really? To make sure it didn't include classified information or any uh. sensitive investigative information. Okay. And so it's not in the book, and I can't talk about it. Okay. Um, <laughs> drink some more wine. <laughs> Lancia. Now, listen, let's talk about Robert Mueller for a second here. Um, uh, if you were Robert Mueller, leading this investigation right now, I'm being very disciplined about it, would you want you out here pushing a book about Donald Trump? Would you want the ex-FBI director out here? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> but the only reason I say probably is... I'm a witness, if I am a witness someday, whose testimony is already locked down. I testified under oath in front of the Senate. I wrote extensive memos. I wrote written testimony to the Senate. And so as long as I'm not making stuff up and, and departing in a material way from that locked-in testimony, it, there's nothing about this that's going to make it harder for me to be a witness. What, what, did, you, what did, did anybody say? Did, did, did you, have you talked to Mueller about this book? Did you say, I'm going to write this book personally to him? No. Okay. Did the FBI say, I wish you wouldn't write this book? No. Okay. Um, let's talk about um, the president for a second. You said as long as you're not making stuff up. The president has said some kind of fun things about you. He has <laughs> called you in the last few days. He has called you a uh, slippery Jim. <laughs> and he has called you a slime ball. Um, anything to say back? No, he's tweeted at me probably 50 times. I've been gone for a year. I'm like a breakup he can't get over. He wakes up in the morning. <laughs> wow. I'm out, there living, I'm out there living my best life. He wakes up in the morning and tweets at me. Wow, wow. He needs to move on, huh? Yeah, you would think Moves so. Moves on. Maybe even move... Okay. But so... my reaction, honestly... But my Chris reaction Wallace. is a shrug. Is What'd a sh you say? My first reaction to those kind of tweets is a shrug, like, oh, there he goes again. But actually, then I caught myself, and I said, wait a minute. If I'm shrugging, are the rest of the country shrugging? And does that mean we become numb to this? It's not OK for the president of the United States to say a private citizen should be in jail. It's not normal. It's not acceptable. It's not OK. But it's happened so much. There's a danger. We're now numb to it, and the norm has been destroyed. And I feel that norm destroying in my own shrug. And so we can't allow that to happen. We have to talk about it and call it out. It's not okay. Well, <laughs> you, uh, he's not the only one who has called you names. Uh, Chris Wallace, talking about your book, called you a uh, bitchy. Hmm. <laughs> because he was surprised about the, uh, you're talking about uh, President Trump's uh, hair and his hand size and the fact that he looks so sort of orange when you see him. Um, uh, why'd you include that? Because I'm trying to be an author. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there typing it. I can hear my editor saying, bring the reader with you. Show the reader that room. And so I say in there, I talk about how I was struck about how skinny President Obama is. I describe John Ashcroft's skin color when he's in intensive care. I'm trying to bring the reader with me. I'm not trying to make fun of John Ashcroft or Barack Obama or even Donald Trump. And 
I'm trying to observe and report. Are you surprised how much attention just that part of this has gotten? Because I want to point out to everybody out there, you know, people I know and respect who are interested in this book have said, like, oh, I don't know, it seems a little tawdry, the hair and the hands. It is one paragraph on page 217 into 218. It's probably six sentences. Okay. <laughs> now it's out of the book. There's another 160 pages in here that are pretty good and pretty gripping. Why do you think people are focusing just on that? Because they haven't read the book, and they're looking to criticize the book and me, and so they're looking for a handhold, and that was an easy handhold. To my mind, it's a silly handhold, but it's something that people grab onto and they can go right on TV and talk about without having done what you've done, which is actually read it. Um, I said, without destroying it, the way I did it. <laughs> um, uh, when, the, when you came out here, um, the audience applauded for you tonight. Um, when I announced that you had been fired uh, almost a year ago, the audience had a slightly different reaction. Jim, uh, play when I announced to the audience who did not know you'd been fired, because it happened in the middle of our show. I, I said to the audience, show them the reaction. Huge story that broke little, just minutes ago, like less than 10 minutes ago. FBI Director James Comey has just been fired by Donald Trump. Oh, wow. Huge, huge Donald Trump fans here tonight. Have you made everyone in the world mad at you? <laughs> I was a little shocked. I thought the audience would be shocked when I told them. But in fact, they were overjoyed that even the man they don't like, President Trump had fired you, and I think because of what they perceived you had done to Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a hangover from the, the Clinton email nightmare. Yeah, when that case began, I knew we were going to piss off at least half of partisans. It never occurred to me we would piss off all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of your, one of the people you worked with on the Clinton investigation at the time said, you know we're screwed. No, he actually said, you know you're totally screwed. All right, we got to go to commercial. When we come back, I, I want to find out whether you, you feel you were screwed, all right, and why you made your decision. We'll be right back with more James Comey. Stick around. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're talking with former FBI Director James Comey about his new book, A Higher Loyalty. Now, before the break, I, I, was, I was asking you about how people reacted to... Um, the two different actions you decided to take uh, with regards to the investigation of Hillary Clinton's um, email servers, her use of a private email server, um, and whether or not classified information had been shared illegally and in any way security had been compromised. Um, the first thing you did was hold a, uh, a, a, I wouldn't call it a press conference, but did you take questions? No. Okay, so you went out and, and you made an announcement yourself as the head of the FBI saying that you had done an investigation and you found no grounds to prosecute Hillary Clinton, but that she had been extremely reckless, I believe careless. is the term. Yeah. Care, extremely careless. Um, why did you do that? And why didn't you tell Loretta Lynch and the Justice Department you were going to do that? Because no FBI director had ever done that before. Right, right. Because it was the least worst way to close the investigation and maintain public confidence that it was done in a, in a competent, honest, independent way. What do you mean, least worst? Well, there were a number of different ways to approach the end of that. The normal thing would have been we'd send the, essentially the substance of what I announced, we'd send it over to the Justice Department and they would issue some sort of one-liner saying the matter is closed. My judgment, which reasonable people can disagree about, was that that would be disastrous for the Department of Justice because there were a number of things that had happened leading up to the end of the investigation. The, the most important at the end being that the Attorney General announced she was not going to recuse herself after her meeting with Bill Clinton on an airplane, but she was going to accept my recommendation and that of the career prosecutors. And so my judgment was the public faith in the FBI and the Justice Department is all we have. If we do the normal thing, corrosive doubt will creep in about whether it was done by the Obama Justice Department in a competent, honest, and independent way. And I thought, if I make my announcement separate, it will maximize the chances that people have confidence in the result, rather than going, I, I really like Loretta Lynch and respect her, but to an attorney general who reasonable people could see as compromised in that situation. And so I made that judgment, something very unusual. I'd never heard of it before. 
but I'd never heard of the FBI investigating one of the two candidates for President of the United States during the election year, and decided that was the best chance we had of closing it in a credible way. Well, I, as I said, and I enjoyed your book, and as I, and one of the things I enjoyed about it is that you give, um, you believe in uh, norms and standards which you believe are being degraded as we speak. The norm and the standard for this investigation would have been to let the Justice Department, let Loretta Lynch make this announcement that had been closed. Why, in this moment of uh, critical uh, revelation, did you decide to break a norm and a standard when you have built your life on them? You're a by-the-book guy. Why yeah. throw out the book yeah. when you needed it most? Yeah, I actually didn't think about it as throwing out the book. The Department of Justice... You tore out a page. Well, I, I, I think I probably tore out half a page. The Department of Justice, in extraordinary cases, has long made announcements at the closing of a case and given lots of details to the public. They had done it just a few months earlier with the investigation into whether there was targeting by the IRS of so-called Tea Party groups because the public confidence in the organization matters. So the department there decided to do that. What I did here that was an unusual and did break a norm was I announced it separately from the Department of Justice. I called the but attorney... But you didn't tell them that you were going to do it. Well, I, I, I did, but not in, not in a way they could have reasonably stopped me. I called beforehand and told Loretta just minutes beforehand, I'm going to do this. Well, that's the same as not telling. Yeah, yeah, that's why, that's why, that's why I'm saying that, 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 that she couldn't... Mom, we're going up to the lake house. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I, I just... My relationship with her was such that I wanted her to know I was going to do it and that I hoped she would understand... But you say in the book that you purposefully kept this decision-making process about whether you're going to do it away from the Justice Department because you thought they might stop you. And then once they ordered you not to, you couldn't. I would not. I, right, I would have obeyed that order. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that was I thought that was the thing best calculated to protect the institutions that I love so much. Now, you say that uh, you were uh, concerned that she asked you to call the Clinton investigation a matter instead of an investigation, and you said, well, we don't do... What did you say? I forgot how did you put it. Well, I, one of the people nearby, standing nearby said, oh, you're the Federal Bureau of Matters now. Uh, I just said, why would I do that? And she said, just do it. Okay. And so, so I that, obeyed that order. That, that, that concerns you. You uh, also, Bill Clinton had met with her in uh, the Justice Department plane on a tarmac. You don't know what they talked about. There was a lot of speculation that he was trying to lean on the Justice Department about the investigation. But you also talk about one other matter in here. You talk about a classified document that is still classified that um, could, in the public's eye, impugn the integrity of uh, the Attorney General Lynch and, therefore, the investigation. Um, that is, seems like a powerful motivator that you can't share with us. C can you not share what is on that document? You're saying there's something about Lynch that doesn't seem right in a document, but you can't tell us what it is. That's an odd poison pill. Yeah, I'm saying, because I believe this, that I don't credit what's in those classified documents. I don't believe Loretta Lynch did anything improper, mm -hmm. but I believe that what was in those documents, if released, would allow reasonable people to question whether the investigation was being done in, in a fair way, mm -hmm. and that's why it worried me. It was one of the things, you left out something, President Obama made it very difficult for us by twice essentially saying there's no there there about the Clinton investigation. Mm -hmm. So all of those things added up to a place where in late June, early July, my judgment was, again, I could be wrong about this, but that mm -hmm. the best thing to do to protect these organizations is for me to spend some of the credibility of the FBI and my personal credibility yep. to show the American people what we did. Um, uh, does anybody else know about this document? Can, can you produce a corroborating witness that there is a document about Loretta Lynch or somebody I could ask and say, this document he's talking about that sort of in the public's eye would impugn her reputation, is there somebody else I could say, yeah, who would corroborate that that exists? Sure. Who, who, who could I ask? I'm not sure I want to give up the names of people at the FBI, but a, a uh, fair number of people at the FBI, still working at the FBI, yeah. know the content. I've gone the, as the far... The reason I want to ask is that w without knowing what that is, it feels like a you-can't-blame-me card that we don't get to see. Yeah. No, I get that. But I, I had to put it in because it was one of the bricks in the load that led to that decision. And I wrestled with it, and I went as far in the book as the FBI would let me go to mm -hmm. describing it. And I get, I'm really worried about being unfair to Loretta, but it's a real thing, and it was a real consideration in my judgment. Um, did you, um, 
what was the consideration to uh, telling Congress, sending a letter to Congress, saying that you were reopening the investigation into Hillary Clinton's uh, emails after Anthony Weiner's laptop was found to have uh, 100,000 emails on it? What was that? What was the rationale there? Because the again, the norm of the standard was that the uh, FBI does not discuss anything having to do with a political campaign 60 days out from the election. Yeah, that's not true, though. It's the, not? The 60-day thing, I don't know where that comes from, but there's a really important norm that I believe in entirely. You take no action, if you can avoid it, that might have an impact on the and on any election. Dog catcher to President of the United States. Well, you had to imagine this was going to have oh, an effect. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, which is why when the team told me there are hundreds of thousands of Hillary Clinton's emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop for reasons I couldn't possibly explain at the time. I, I can explain it. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but not just that. This is uh, something folks often miss. They said there's thousands of emails from her blackberry.net domain, which is what she used her first three months as Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And you'll remember that the reason there was no case there was there was no evidence of, of wrongful intent on her part. It may have, she was sloppy, but there's no evidence she knew she was doing something she shouldn't. Unlike Petraeus, say, Correct. who gave up classified notebooks to his lover and allowed her to take photographs of them in, you know, in a state of mortal sin in that he knew what he was doing. Was right, bad. and then he lied about it, which made clear he knew what he was doing. He was the director of the CIA, for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. She looked like someone who wasn't attentive to security, didn't know technology well. But if there was going to be a smoking gun where someone said, hey, you can't do this, mm -hmm. or you ought to stop doing what you're doing, it would be in the beginning. So the team said to me on October 27th, there are hundreds of thousands of her emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop, and there are thousands of emails from the missing blackberry.net domain. This could change the outcome of the investigation. And so at that point, what do you do? Take no action if you can avoid it. And I kept looking for a door that said no action here, and I couldn't find it. I could only see two doors, and they're both actions. One says speak, the other says conceal. Speaking would be really bad. Well, conceal naturally has a pejorative to it. It's speak or, or uh, standard discretion of the FBI. It's not the same thing as concealing. Yeah, I disagree, though. If we hadn't spoken, Loretta Lynch and I had not announced to the American people in testimony during the summer and in my statement and other things, we're done, you can move on here, American people, there's no there there. If that hadn't happened, sure, you'd have the option of saying, nobody knows about this, so we'll keep it quiet. But having spoken repeatedly, my view, and people can disagree about this, would be that to not speak would be an affirmative act of concealment. I knew that something we had told the American people they could rely upon was not true, and not true in a huge way, not some silly way, hundreds of thousands of emails on Anthony Weiner's computer, and the FBI team said, no way, boss, we can review this before the election. So what do you do? Speaking would be really bad. Concealing would be catastrophic. In my judgment, again, people can see it differently. So as between really bad and catastrophic, it's not that hard to call. You've got to do the really bad thing. Well, one is bad immediately. One is possibly bad later which sounds like Pascal's wager to me. So you were weighing a certainty that it's bad now with maybe people would be upset later. Well, I, I didn't see it as a maybe. Well, I, let, let me ask you another question. Right. I, we, got, we got to take a little commercial break here, but let me ask you this. My wife called me the minute that this came out, that you were announcing that you were reopening the investigation. You sent the letter to Congress. Congress leaked it. We know. 11 days out. She called me and said, that's it. It's over. Her campaign's dead. And I said, no, 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 it's going to be fine. This isn't going to have an effect. Which of us do you think was right? <laughs> I honestly don't know. I pray that you're right. It makes me sick to my stomach to think we might have had an impact. I hope and pray we didn't. But I hope this doesn't sound strange. It, it wouldn't change the decision. If you travel back to October 28th, you can't see the future. What do you do? And... You get back in the time machine, go yeah, back yeah. another 70 yeah. years and kill baby Hitler. But yeah. then, <laughs> then you come back to October and you don't release the emails. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, we, we got to take a little break. Um, when we come back, I want to talk about uh, Russia and uh, the president asking you about the PP pee -pee tape. When you, when, you, when you telling him about it and him talking to you about that, all right? Can we do that? You can call it that. <laughs> I will. We'll be right back with more James Comey. Folks, 
And we're back here with uh, former FBI Director James Comey. He's got a great new book, A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership. I read it. It's really good. Don't read page 217 to 218 if you don't want to hear about the hands and the hair. Okay. Now, uh, let's do a quick lightning round. We've only got a few minutes here. Um, you went in in January of 2017 to tell President Trump about the Steele dossier. How did you tell him that there was a, and I want to put this delicately, pee-pee tape? How did you tell him about that rumor? I spoke about information, unverified, that related to an allegation that he was with prostitutes in a hotel in Moscow and that the Russians had uh, videotaped it. I didn't go into the rest of it. I thought that was notice enough. Uh -huh. and I was... So you didn't mention the salacious detail of, of the two prostitutes getting up on the bed that o the Obamas had stayed in because it was the presidential suite uh, and, and uh, um, you know, uh, engaging in some water play. You didn't, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't mention that at all. I thought I'd, I'd served enough notice without going to that part. Okay, and what did he, what did he say when you told him about this? He denied it. He interrupted me and denied it in pretty strong terms and asked, I assumed rhetorically, whether he looked like a guy who needed the services of hookers. And then... And <laughs> okay, okay. All right, let's keep on going. Yeah. yeah. Because, look, I want to be, you know, delicate here, but he looks like a microwave circus peanut that someone rubbed on a golden retriever. All right. <laughs> okay. By the way, I went to that room. Just so you know, the people out there know, I actually went to that room. I stayed at the Ritz-Carlton, Ritz-Carlton Moscow. I went to that room. We rented that room, which is really all you need to do. Now, you're an investigator. D did, did anyone from your office ever go to that, that, that hotel and look at that room? Not while I was director. Okay. I don't know anyone from the press who went, you're an investigator. Would you like to ask me anything about that room? <laughs> ask me anything about that room. Is it big enough for the, a germaphobe to be at a safe distance from the activity? The bedroom is very long. It's very long. You could, be, you could definitely be out of what we call at SeaWorld the splash zone. <laughs> okay? Okay? All right? Yeah. I, I, I met people. I didn't know how to put this on air. I met people who are very, very rich, and uh, the, some people there knew, had, had knowledge of the party. That this took place at. Would you like to know anything about that or his attendance? Not right now, thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Call me. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, let's see. B -b 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 do you uh, do you kick yourself for not clarifying uh, Trump asking you to let it go when it came to Michael Flynn? A little bit, but I'm trying to be fair to myself. The President of the United States had kicked out my boss and the mm -hmm. Vice President. Yeah. And. And it seemed clear to me what he was asking. And so I think, on balance, I'm, I, I, it was OK that I didn't ask for clarification. Do you kick yourself for not saying to President Trump, you can't ask an FBI director for loyalty? That maybe a little bit. I think I accomplished that, though, because he asked for it, and I gave him a stare. Mm -hmm. And then before he asked for it again at the end of the conversation, I gave little interruptions to explain the importance of the distance between the FBI and Justice Department and the President. Mm -hmm. And so I think I had accomplished that goal by the end of the conversation. Um, uh, what happens if Mueller gets fired and Rosenstein gets fired? Does the investigation go on? I think most likely it goes on. I think you would need to fire everyone in the Justice Department and the FBI to stop that investigation. Oh, you could just fire those two guys. <laughs> but you could fire those two guys, and you could put somebody in there who's uh, a toady, and he goes, yeah, we looked, there's nothing. That's possible, but I, knowing the culture of those organizations the way I do, I could imagine U.S. Attorney's Office is picking it up, FBI field office is picking it up. I think it'd be very hard to shut that down by firing. Mm-hmm. Hard to fire the FBI director, too. <laughs> All right. Um, do you wish you were in there as part of this investigation? You've always been a guy who was in the know, and now you have to guess like the rest of us. Do, do, do you wish you were in there on the team? I do. I miss the people and the mission. I don't miss some of the political types, but I miss being with the people, the FBI, and the Justice Department. And when you were uh, being interviewed by George Stephanopoulos, uh, he asked you about impeachment. And you said you don't think that impeachment is really the answer here, that that would be a mistake, and that Americans shouldn't be let off the hook through impeachment. They should go vote this man out and take responsibility. That sounds a little bit like you're blaming the voters for the predicament we're in right now. Do you? 
Well, maybe partly. I, and I mostly blame those who haven't voted. And Did you vote? No, I was the FBI director. Are you going to vote in 2020? Yes, I will. Uh, but, but what I meant by the impeachment comment is, look, the law and the facts will drive whether there's an impeachment process. What I was saying to George Stephanopoulos was, in a way, that would short circuit something we need. We need a moment of clarity and inflection in this country. We need the people of this country, I hope the great middle, to get off the couch, get out of their busy lives, and say the values of our leadership matters. And more than policy disputes, more than the rest of it. We stand for something in this country, and we need to send a signal that we know that and we treasure it. What's after this? How do we get past this moment? I think back to um, uh, Lincoln's second inaugural talking about how the country will come together after the Civil War. And while we're not in a Civil War, we're in a terribly divided time. How do you think we come to agreement uh, after all of this about what our shared values are? By everybody participating in that conversation. And I, I write in the end of the book, and I hope an optimistic note, that although I see Donald Trump as a forest fire, he will do great damage to our norms. Forest fires allow things to grow that couldn't grow before. I see kids getting energized. It's inspiring to see kids in the wake of Parkland out there getting involved. I see all parts of civil society, the media, the courts, even Congress starting to get off its rear end. I see parts of this country being energized that haven't been energized, frankly, since the last great forest fire, which was Watergate. And so I'm optimistic that this country's values are strong enough that we will not only survive this, we will thrive and rebalance ourselves in the wake of this. Well, Mr. Comey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Really enjoyed talking to you. A Higher Loyalty is available now. It's worth reading. James Comey, everybody. We'll be right back with Jason Aldean.